In Peru, right during our pregnancy, the COVID pandemic was right at its height. There were between six and 7,000 cases, COVID cases every day, and the medical system was just collapsing. They were not prepared to cope with uh, this problem. Um, it was so bad that a lot of times people were going and just in the car parking lot to receive oxygen. This is the worst time ever to be expecting a baby and nothing went according to plan, absolutely nothing. She gave him to me and laid him on my chest and she told me to say goodbye to him. And I remember just crying out to God, please save my baby. Well, my name is Daniel Matsuda. I'm a Baptist pastor here in Arequipa. And we're in Arequipa now since uh, 2016, I think. Uh, serving the Lord as a pastor here uh, and it's been great serving our Lord here almost two years ago when uh, COVID hit uh, was hard for a lot of people in this area uh, the people from our church was ha were having a, a hard time and the people that they know were also having a hard time the president of Peru announced uh, a total lockdown in Peru that as of the next day, no one was allowed out of their house, no one was allowed to go anywhere, businesses were shut down. Uh, you would only be allowed to go out for absolute necessities. Because of COVID, they, didn't, they couldn't even work. Uh, the government put a bunch of re restrictions uh, and it was hard for people. Imagine not working for two or three months. Praise the Lord, different churches in the States got together and started sending some money so we can help these people in need. Uh, during 2020, that's what, uh, basically that's what our ministry was. And we're making almost 200 packages per week here in Arequipa. And we were also sending help to other churches uh, across Peru, even Chile in Venezuela. I was getting closer to uh, my 20th week. And at this point, we still had not had any ultrasounds, any doctor checkups, no zero tests, uh, nothing and I called uh, a doctor and she helped me out. She said, I'm going to help you get a clandestine ultrasound. And so um, we did, and that was actually my first time out of the house since the quarantine started. I had been inside the whole time. And we found out, well, I found out, I was by myself, he wasn't allowed, my husband wasn't allowed in, that the baby was completely healthy I was right on track. We were 20 weeks along and we were going to have a little boy. Because of COVID and all the restrictions that were happening, clinics were not wanting there to be natural births. They only wanted to schedule C-sections. And I did, I did not want to have a C-section. Um, physically, there's no reason for it. I wanted to have a natural birth. As we got closer and closer, and I was talking to my doctor, I was talking, we came to the decision that we would have a home birth. I had already delivered two babies here in Arequipa, and my doctor was wonderful. But this wasn't a decision that we made lightly. Um, I, I was raised in Peru, um, and my mother had a home birth in Peru. And um, my brother was born but he was having trouble breathing. They had to take him to a hospital. And on the third day, he was, he was dead. And instead of bringing my baby brother home, we, we had to bury him. And that was very, very hard on, on our family. And I promised myself I would never have a home birth in Peru because of everything that happened. We were running out of choices. In Peru, they have a rule, even when there isn't COVID going on, that the husband is not allowed into the public hospital if his wife is giving birth. And with COVID going on, it's much more so. No one is allowed in or out. In fact, there were already stories that if the mother had tested positive, that at birth they would separate the, the baby from the mother. As soon as the mother arrived, they would do a COVID test. 
And we knew that since I had just had COVID at seven months, in my seventh month of pregnancy, that I would obviously test positive. If either the mother or father tested positive for COVID, they would automatically send the pregnant mother to the COVID hospital of the city. And we did not want that. The healthcare system in this country, especially the public healthcare system is definitely not the best. And I did not want to have to go through birth without my husband, without my doctor. We, we felt this was the best thing that we could do, that we had peace about, that we would have a home birth. Uh, we had scheduled a second ultrasound for week 37, but I never made it to week 37. At, at week 36, I, start, I went into labor. I had only been having contractions for about an hour, and I told him to call the doctor. And she arrived with a team of two other doctors, so there were three doctors that arrived to our house at about 11.30 p.m. When they arrived, um, they checked me and I was dilated 10 centimeters. It was time to push. And I started pushing, but nothing was happening. The baby wasn't coming. And when she checked me, she was like paralyzed with fear. Yeah, oh no. Something changed in her face when, when, when she checked you out. She was terrified. And she said, stop pushing. You cannot push. This baby cannot be delivered here. Get up and get the car ready. We have to rush you to the hospital and I'm gonna take you to the COVID hospital because there's no time. Your baby is breech. He is feet first. Um, so I, at this point, of course, I was terrified. What, what's gonna happen? You know, it's like my worst fear is coming true. I'm gonna have to go to the hospital anyway. And he's breech. We had no idea he wasn't in the right position. I stood up. And as I stood up, the contraction started coming out so strong that there was no way to control it. There's no way to not push. And I did start pushing and my son's foot came out. The doctor realized that he was doing the splits. One leg was out and the other leg was sticking straight up. And so uh, my doctor had to reach inside and lead his other leg out and it, it turned into a nightmare. Um, it was very, very, very painful. Obviously there was no pain medication or epidural or anything like that involved. Um, my husband was trying to help put me into several different positions, trying to um, have gravity help uh, whatever we could to be getting his body out. It was very, very difficult for each little part of his body to come. When it finally got to his shoulders, it was all very hard. Finally, his whole body had been delivered except for his head, and his head could not come out. It was stuck, and he was facing the opposite way. Um, but my doctor, once again, was... This was very, very urgent. She kept telling me, we. You have to do whatever you've got to do. He, his body wasn't moving. He wasn't reacting in any way and they couldn't, they couldn't find the, his heartbeat was very, very faint. So we knew he wasn't receiving oxygen. He was obviously in distress. Um, finally, my doctor managed to put her fingers inside of his mouth and twist him around and, and pull him out. By this point it was 12.30, around 12.30. We never knew exactly what time he was born because of everything that was happening. Yeah. And um, he wasn't, he wasn't responding. He wasn't breathing. Um, my husband was trying to keep me from looking at him because we both thought he was gone. He was just laying there and he wasn't moving or crying or anything. And the doctor was trying to, to help him breathe. Uh, she, was, she was doing the mouth-to-mouth -mouth. Uh, mouth -mouth CPR, but there was no response for the baby. I remember at one point they had his, they were grabbing him by his feet, um, and kind of shaking, shaking him, and 
it was the most, that was the most painful, traumatic thing I'd ever been through, but at that point, nothing mattered. All we were praying for and begging God for was let him, let him cry, let him breathe. Several minutes passed and he wasn't, he wasn't breathing, he wasn't reacting. They, my doctor, um, she gave him to me and laid him on my chest and she told me to say goodbye to him. And I remember just crying out to God, please save my baby. And he started breathing. He started breathing very, very faintly. He wasn't, he wasn't crying. He definitely wasn't screaming, but there was a very faint, he was alive. And I only had one, two minutes. Yeah. It was, it was just a little bit of time that I, I talked to my son. I told him how much I loved him and I needed him to be okay. And the, they then took my, my husband and two of the doctors grabbed him and took him to the car to race him to a hospital. At that point, I stayed behind with one of the doctors. I hadn't even delivered the placenta at, at this time. And my husband drove like a maniac, racing him too. And once again, my doctor told him to take him to the COVID hospital because they were the most implemented. They had all the latest technology and the best machines. And when they got there, they didn't want to receive him because he wasn't a COVID patient. And my husband... In a sense, I just forced him to do it. I, we were already there. Where are we going to go now? We're there at the hospital, and there's the baby. He needs help. He needs attention. And the doctors, our doctors, kept telling us, just keep doing it. Keep forcing him. To, to save my, my baby's life, I was so persistent that they finally uh, uh, accepted me there. And they walk in, walk back in, and I was just standing there, and, and it was like, what do I do? I'm, I'm just standing here doing nothing. Finally, the nurse came and said, whatever happens, we're going to come to tell you, so you just have to wait. But I, I, I came out trying to ask, how is he doing? And, and they didn't say anything. They said, we cannot tell you right now. You just have to wait. And man, that was, you know, not, not knowing what's going on with the baby. That's what it was so hard for me because, you know, I was expecting for him to tell me he's okay, he's breathing now, he's in the but he didn't tell, we cannot tell you now. A few hours later, the same doctor came and he told me, you know, he's stable, but he has to stay in the hospital and there's nothing you can do here. So he's just go home. And, and again, I, I drove back home and I see my wife there laying down and she asked me, so what's happening? And I, I didn't have an answer for her. That was very painful. That was very hard for me because as a man, I want to be in control. And at that point, I was not in control of anything. I was just, I don't know. I lay down beside her and we cried together. We prayed together. And obviously I couldn't sleep that night and, and it, was, it was hard. The next day they told me that to bring some di a diaper and some of the, uh, breast milk. the breast milk. And I was expecting an answer, so how is he? And he was a different doctor now. And I said, who are you? And I tell the, the whole story again. That person went, by, uh, went in, he came out, same thing. We, we cannot tell you anything yet. I just didn't understand why. I, I'm there to see my son. I want to see my son. Is he okay? How's he doing? Or what's happening? And they didn't say anything because of COVID, and uh, they won't, they won't let anyone to get uh, in to see anything inside. So I was basically in a, in a door, and there was a big corridor, and, and all the babies were like a hundred meters away from, from where we are. So we couldn't even hear them cry or anything. We didn't know what happened. And there was a bunch of parents there waiting outside. I kept asking, how's my son? Just tell me something. Is he okay? Is he gonna make it or not? Finally, the nurse said, look, 
we're taking care of him, but you, you just need to wait. And you heard horror stories about hospitals here in Peru. The, the babies or people will die and they will not tell you until who knows when. So that was was making me uh, uh, scared. I didn't know what was happening. So that was for three days? He was born Friday night, which was by the time he was born, it was already Saturday morning. So it was all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and then finally Monday. On Monday, I went back. And I, I was desperate. I was just crying and, and, and asking, what's happening? The doctor came to me, came to me and, and she told me, he's okay. When she said that, man, it was like, finally I can breathe. I, I was, uh, uh, but, but, I, I kept, but are you sure? I'm talking about Arthur, Arthur Paul, the little baby that I, I brought just uh, two nights ago. He said, yep. He's okay. He's not a machine. He's not connected to machines anymore. And they said, "When I can? When can I? I take my baby?" And she said, "Well, you have to wait." That was really that was early, 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 early in the morning. morning. I'm gonna call you," she said. I went back home, and I'm waiting. And the doctor called me and said, "Can you come?" I said, "Sure, I can." Uh, and I said, "Yeah, your baby is gonna be going home today." And I, and I was for real. So we drove back to the hospital and uh, I got in and, and the doctors, other people were telling me that bill is going to be huge. We don't have insurance. I was with the fear how much this is going to be. She, she explained to me since this was the COVID hospital, the government was paying for everything that was happening down the hospital. So we didn't have to pay for anything. And the doctor told me, this is not a time for the patients to leave the hospital, but this baby needs to be with his mom. So I walk out, and I was okay, holding the baby and, and walking to the car, but then when I saw my wife sitting in the car, I just, I started crying, I couldn't control myself. I, I, was, I, I, I handed the baby to her, and, and she started crying. We, we hug each other, we cry, and we find the heart of baby in our hand, and it was, it was like, it's here. It was so amazing and we got to bring him home for our family to meet him. Heidi is a miracle baby. He was born premature and we were so happy when he finally came home. Well, I really love my baby brother. He, he I thought he was, was going to die and my dad brought him home and he, he now he's 11 months old and I love him so much. <laughs> Even the doctor who, who told me to take, uh, I can take him now, she said that it's a miracle that this baby is living now. She, she also told him that they had run every test possible because there should have been so many problems with him. He, he could have had mental problems, physical handicaps. This is a miracle, but there is nothing wrong with your baby. Your baby is a perfectly healthy baby. <laughs> All we could do is <laughs> praise God at how good, how good he is. My doctors were so great. They, they did what needed to be done. They weren't, you know, they were gonna do whatever it took and they were just in shock. They held the baby and they were just praising God that he was alive, that he was okay, and they, they said, this, this is the miracle baby. <laughs> he gave us the scare of, of a lifetime. <laughs> and even that he was born one, uh, one month, month early. So if he had made it to the full 40 weeks, he would have been, he would have been much bigger. The way everything worked out was, it was just God, God and his goodness and, and and every step of the way, he was working on it. Nothing went according to our plan. And, and I believe that that was also God's thing, to show me that nothing is my plan, but his plan. When we went through everything with, with our son Arthur, it was like the story of my brother repeating itself. It's made this experience of what I've gone through with my son so much more amazing because I know very well how this story could have ended. I lived it, 
and watching the amazing miracle God did in my family, in my life, in my son's life, it just makes it so much more amazing. And all we can do is <laughs> praise God and thank Him for how good He's been to us. Arthur is our COVID baby. So even though he never had COVID, he is our miracle COVID baby. Our miracle baby will be one year old next month. <laughs> He's got a personality, temper. <laughs> he is a healthy baby. <laughs> He's trying really hard to walk. And he has an amazing set of lungs. <laughs> <laughs> We joke now saying that he couldn't even cry before, but now we cannot stop him to cry. cry. Stop him from crying. <laughs> stop him from crying. 